right here is part of the footprint of the coconut grove. So you had the front door just right over here. So this would have been part of the character bar and heading towards the dance floor and the dining room, which is right behind us within the confines of the Revere Hotel. My name is Dr. Kenneth Marshall. I'm the uh, chairperson of the uh, Coconut Grove Memorial Committee, a committee that formed after the tragic event of the Coconut Grove fire of 1942. And over the last several years, with the encouragement of the few remaining survivors, and particularly the families who lost people in the fire, we've been encouraged to pursue the potential of getting a real memorial built. I'm Mike Hanlon. I'm a co-founder of the Coconut Grove Memorial Committee and serve as the secretary and treasurer. My connection to the, to the fire and to the whole story is that my mother was a Coconut Grove fire nurse who actually took care of a sizable number of the burned patients at the Boston City Hospital. I've lived with the story my entire life because she had post-traumatic stress disorder, remembering the vision of all of the uh, bodies in their evening clothes just lined up in rows on the city hospital parking lot. And King Solomon, just a notorious guy, and he buys the Coconut Grove and kind of makes it a little bit of a speakeasy. It was King Charles Solomon that instituted the process of locking doors to prevent people from leaving before they pay their bill. A fact that is a bit indictable, if you will. He had a sense, or he had been told that people were having dinner and so on and so forth, and they would walk out that side door. So he said, well, we'll put a stop to that. And he had them locked and bolted. Uh, greed persisted over sanity. Uh, it was grab every dollar you could. They bring in a very popular interior decorator uh, who basically is told, spare no amount, just make it the swankiest club in Boston. And that's what it became. And over the 1930s, right up to the time of the fire, the Coconut Grove gradually became the star on the Walk of Fame. It became the nightclub in the city, and it was where all the famous entertainers played. Sophie Tucker, Jimmy Durante, uh, Frank Sinatra, uh, everybody played at the Coconut Grove. When you almost look at, at the footprint of the Coconut Grove, it's almost like an inverted Z. Here's the front door of the original club, and then it jets up, and then it goes back again. And there were three different parts of, of the Coconut Grove. There were really only two public uh, modes of exit. The front exit on Piedmont Street was a circular door which had no paired doors on either side. The Broadway lounge at the back end of the club. Nobody knows how many people were in the club that night. It was estimated that it should not have had more than 400 people. The place was jam-packed. Uh, the other two rooms were all jam-packed with people. On that night, they just kept putting down tables and chairs, blocking all kinds of pathways. When you entered through the revolving door, you could go around the corner and go downstairs, and that's where the Melanie Lounge was located. And that's where the fire originated. It is said that a, a fellow who was having a wonderful evening with his date unscrewed a light bulb so that he had, could have a more intimate experience. And he unscrewed a light bulb, which the bartender witnessed. And the bartender asked another very young busboy named Tom Azuski, uh, to re-screw the light bulb in. A waiter came running through the door and saw Jimmy and grabbed him by the arm and said, there's a fire. And Jimmy said, where? And, he, and, the, and the waiter said, everywhere. The actual duration of the fire, the estimates are anywhere between a low of seven minutes and 25 minutes. It was not longer than 25. There is literally only one photograph that shows smoke coming from the building outside. That's how fast the fire was out. So this was a 
like a bolt of lightning, too rapid to respond. People will tell you that the human instinct is to retreat the way you came in, which is usually an error. And it was a classic error in the coconut grove because the circular door turned out to be a death trap. So you had a circumstance where doors were locked, doors were covered by coat racks, and windows were boarded up. Uh, and, and again, some of that was, you know, an inspector could have said, hey, move the coat rack, take the wood off so the windows are shown, unlock the doors, it didn't happen. But when fire people finally got in, there were several figures literally asphyxiated, seated at their tables because they couldn't get out. This story is one of the major stories of trauma in the history of the United States. It's not just a Boston story or a New England story. This is uh, certainly, with all, all of the progress that came out of it, this is something that should not, not be lost. I had asked Ken if he had ever been to the site, but he said he hadn't, and he wasn't quite sure of the exact location. So we <clears throat> drove in town to uh, 17 Piedmont Street, which is in the Bay Village neighborhood of Boston, right off of Stewart Street. And there was a, a memorial plaque that's placed in the sidewalk, which was more or less in the front door entrance of the Coconut Grove. We ended up going to the Public Improvement Office, and we petitioned them to change the name of this street from Shawmut uh, Street Extension to Coconut Grove Lane. And that effort took us maybe six months to do. This is Stanley Tomaszynski, and uh, he worked at the uh, nightclub on weekends. But throughout his lifetime, people either wrote him notes or called him on the telephone to curse him for causing the death of their relatives or, or, or parents. And he lived with that till the day he died. He was absolutely innocent, and they were trying to scapegoat a 16-year-old kid the death of 490 people. So the message of the memorial, number one, it should memorialize the 490 who lost their lives. Number two, it should tell a story of what really happened here. Uh, the progress that came out of this fire, which is monumental in terms of fire safety of all different dimensions, both building materials and safety devices. And at the bottom is written the phrase, Phoenix out of ashes. That is the summary of what happened here. This is a terrible tragedy symbolized by the word ashes. The phoenix of the tremendous progress that came out of it. And that's what we don't want lost. And hopefully this will become a learning and teaching experience for whoever visits it. We're looking at, in this vicinity, to have a memorial placed. And, and Piedmont Street is just on the other side of that garage. The story each year just kept getting forgotten. And uh, I think that through our efforts, uh, we've made a, a, a strong commitment that this event should not be forgotten.